to the Entrepreneur Bootcamp Session 1. Um, I welcome all of our drone enthusiasts joining us for Session 1 of this Entrepreneur uh, Bootcamp. The Drone Tech Innovation Showcase is a series of events brought to you by the Saldana Bay Innovation Campus, an initiative of the Saldana Bay Industrial Development Zone. These events include drone TED, uh, tech talks, of which recorded sessions are available on YouTube, an entrepreneur bootcamp, which you're attending today, and a drone tech innovation challenge. These all lead up to the uh, very exciting innovation day on the 1st of October. For more information, please follow the Saldana Bay Industrial Development Zone on LinkedIn. Our Entrepreneur Bootcamp is dedicated to all the entrepreneurs and inspiring entrepreneurs. We have gathered industry experts to share their knowledge with you so that you do not have to figure it out on your own like so many entrepreneurs do. The Bootcamp today is split into two sessions. Session one, which is on now, will focus on founder journeys and how to navigate the startup ecosystem in South Africa. Session two will start at 15.30, that's 3.30 this afternoon, and focuses on the skills and tools needed to start and scale your business and the principles of design thinking. If you'd like to register for session two, I believe you can let us know that uh, you are interested by typing into the Q&A box and the administrators behind the scenes will send you a registration link. So I've been asked to raise a few housekeeping points before we officially start. Everyone's mics have been muted for the duration of the session. Please ask your questions through the Q&A box on this Zoom session once the Q&A session begins, or you can raise your hand um, to ask your questions to the speaker directly. Um, and I believe the host will alternate questions between the raised hands and the Q&A box. I hope I've covered everything from a housekeeping and admin perspective. And so we are now going to um, hear from our first speaker for the founder journeys, Professor Oscar Philander, Associate Professor in the Department of Mechanical Engineering at the Cape Peninsula University of Technology. Uh, Professor Philander, over to you. Thank you, Kim. I'll just switch on my uh, video just for a split second. Uh, thank you uh, for that introduction, Kim, uh, and thank you uh, to the audience that is attending today. Um, I'll just take a, a few seconds just to upload my uh, presentation and the host has disabled uh, 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 that ability of mine. Can the host please allow me to share my uh, screen? Anyway, so, so, so while I'm waiting uh, for that, um, I'm currently the director of a technology station uh, focused on advanced manufacturing uh, located within the Department of Mechanical Engineering at CPUT. Um, the primary focus of, of, of this unit really uh, is to provide engineering support to SMMEs uh, in all forms of engineering consulting services. Um, and my, my research really uh, in, in drones started some time back 
um, 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 I would say probably about 30 years ago. And I will just take you on that actual journey on, on how uh, the, the drone bug bit me and where we are at the moment and some of the very exciting uh, research projects that, that I'm currently involved in. So I'll just try again, uh, there we go. Uh, Kim, can you see the, 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 the screen? I can indeed, and if you just put it onto presentation mode, it will be 100%. There we go. Perfect. Okay. So, so as I said, uh, the, my, my, my title really is just about uh, uh, RPES, UAV, or, or drone development. Uh, that, is, that has happened at CPUT, and then of course my journey as well. Now, uh, uh, my, uh, I, I would say my, my, my journey was influenced by quite a lot of uh, things that happen in our country. And one of the, the, the first things that, that is really notable was that my institution was uh, uh, in 1970, uh, or in the 1970s, uh, it was known as the College of Advanced Technical Education, and then rebranded as the Peninsula Colleges for Advanced uh, Technical Education. In 1979, it became known as the Peninsula Technicon, and a Technicon really in, in a South African sense uh, was this post-secondary uh, institute of technology uh, that was focused primarily on career-orientated vocational training. So essentially, uh, uh, the idea there was to produce technicians that would go and work in, in uh, uh, factories um, and essentially run equipment and machines uh, for, for the economy uh, uh, um, in, in those years. Now, something very important happened in 1993 uh, when the Technicons Act was promulgated and it allowed Technicons then uh, to offer bachelor's degrees in the form of a BTEC, master's in terms of an uh, uh, MTEC and a doctoral degrees in the form of, of DTECs. And then uh, CPUT, my institution, Cape Peninsula University of Technology, was formed in 1995 through the uh, uh, merger of the Cape and Peninsula Technicons. Now, uh, this short little history is very important because uh, you'll see how these changes actually played a role in my development as a, a, a academic uh, and also as a, a, a drone inventor or innovator. So uh, my formative years uh, was spent in Steenberg uh, on the Cape Flats. This is actually the house uh, uh, where my uh, parents or my father grew up. And this is where I, I spent most of my formative years up until the age of about eight. I matriculated in 1991 uh, from uh, Grassy Park Senior Secondary. And believe me, that kid over there had no idea of wanting to go into the engineering field at all. In fact, at that stage, I was accepted to become a nurse in one of the, the uh, nursing uh, colleges uh, here in the Western Cape. However, my father said that was not going to happen. And on the first day of registration in 1992, uh, um, um, I went to uh, Peninsula Technicon, um, hoping to be accepted for mechanical engineering, and that is exactly what happened, and that is when my engineering uh, uh, um, career really started. So the next slide is a very busy slide, uh, but this, this is just a snapshot of what actually goes on in my brain on a daily basis, so Kim, please forgive me. <laughs> Uh, but, but, but you'll see there that um, in 1991, as I said, I matriculated. In 92, uh, I was a first year engineering student, uh, uh, um, uh, registered for a national diploma. And then uh, in 1994, obtained my, my national diploma. Now, um, I would say probably in, in, in that first couple of years, I, I was a pretty average student. Um, um, and as you recall, uh, in the previous slide, I said in 1993, uh, Technicons could uh, start to offer uh, the, 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 the BTEC, MTEC and, and, and DTEC uh, qualifications. And I was part of a first cohort of students um, um, that, that entered uh, uh, the Technicon to start with the S program. And at that stage, they were starting to phase out the, the T uh, programs that uh, uh, was, was running at that time. So I became part of that first cohort. Now in 1994, something very important happened. Obviously uh, we had our 1994 elections and the government of South Africa changed. And there was this, this huge 
um, um, or, or there was this idea that, that we could now become anything uh, uh, that we put our minds to. And that is one of the things that, that really uh, drove my uh, development uh, at that time. So in 95, I, I became uh, part of the first cohort uh, to do the BTEC or, or uh, the bachelor's uh, degree in technology. And uh, in, I completed that in 1995 and then stayed on to do my master's degree uh, or uh, to, to do the MTEC. And it was during this period, however, that uh, something very important happened uh, to me. I was introduced to uh, continuum mechanics and the finite element method. And I'll just go to that link over there. And you must remember now, now previously, uh, um, 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 doing uh, technical studies or, or, or these technical studies, we were exposed to quite a lot of formula um, 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 in theory um, um, on solving engineering problems. But what continuum mechanics does, right, it basically opens up uh, uh, that space where uh, you actually get to find out where these equations come from and how they are actually formulated. And then instead of seeing a beam or a car or an airplane, you, you basically see uh, the, 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 the fundamental elements of uh, the mathematics that drive the development of, of these systems and structures. Similarly, also with the finite element method, um, um, I was then taught these things. Um, um, and I could then implement it uh, towards my, my, my master's studies. And my master's studies focus primarily on uh, the development of mathematical coding or, or constitutive models uh, to simulate welding processes. And um, um, in 1997, I completed my MTech um, and I became the, uh, one of the first students uh, to get a master's degree from uh, Peninsula Technicon. I then continued with, with uh, uh, my uh, research, uh, starting um, um, as a part-time lecturer, then contract lecturer, and then of course registered for my doctoral studies. And this however focused more on smart materials and integrating smart materials into your conventional materials, giving them intelligence, um, um, and essentially developing mathematical uh, models and constructive models to describe the behavior of these materials. Um, in 2002, I established my first research group called the Smart Alignment Systems Research Group, and it was funded by the National Research Foundation, and then obtained two scholarships, one uh, to study in, uh, in the US at uh, the University of Michigan, um, um, and then another scholarship through the uh, German uh, government's DART scholarship program uh, to study at the Technical University of Berlin. Now, these study programs had, had two uh, primary focuses. The first one um, was obviously for, for, for me to um, um, study towards my, my doctoral qualifications. And secondly, then uh, uh, to go on these uh, um, um, uh, programs and then come back uh, to South Africa and develop uh, similar short course modules for our masters and, and doctoral students. And that's in fact what I, uh, what I then did. Um, in 2005, I uh, established the Center for Research in Applied Technology or CRATEC for short, um, I'm also funded by the NRF, but my group then, then actually grew a little bit. In 2005, uh, I obtained my, my, my doctoral uh, degree uh, a DTEC in mechanical engineering, and that focused primarily on the constitutive modeling of these smart materials. And I developed a, a computational software tool uh, to use these materials in mechanical design of systems and structures. And I became the first person to get a degree or a doctor's degree from CPUT uh, um, 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 then. Right. Um, then uh, my, my uh, academic career took quite a, a huge leap uh, when I went from a lecturer, a senior lecturer to associate uh, professor in the Department of Mechanical Engineering. And for the, a very short uh, uh, period of time, I became the head of research for the Department of Mechanical Engineering. In 2007, I started a, uh, uh, the AMTL or the Adaptronics AMTL um, and primarily Adaptronics is that technology that integrates uh, uh, sensor and actuator functions into material, giving them intelligence. Now, my passion for, 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 for drones uh, didn't really start off 
are with drones specifically, but more creating materials that could be used in the aerospace industry, essentially by integrating these materials uh, into your aircraft structures, uh, thus giving them intelligence. And uh, that's how it really then started. After, I think, about a year of engaging with industry, uh, your denials, the CSIR, um, and, and really not getting anywhere, I then just decided to, to, to develop my own drone. And then in a matter of, of six months, uh, we basically formulated a, 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 a virtual client, and for that, developed an airframe to suit a specific type of uh, um, a mission or application. And uh, towards the end of 2007, we had our first flight, um, and really, the, the uh, I, I was hooked. Uh, in 2008, I, I uh, formed a partnership with Airbus to develop smart uh, uh, actuating technologies uh, uh, with their future uh, projects group uh, based in Toulouse, and uh, that that project continued until 2012 as well. Now, these are just some videos of our initial uh, uh, drones and, and, and developments, and uh, we called our drone Guardian One. Um, um, and, and, and the work then, then progressed. Um, so, so as I said, we, we basically taught ourselves by raiding uh, the libraries of Stellenbosch University and UCT and getting books on, on aeronautics, uh, uh, um, um, uh, aerospace, and then basically developed our own little program to teach ourselves how to design these vehicles. At the same time, we then also developed the manufacturing process uh, uh, through composite materials, uh, or, or rather through composites manufacturing to manufacture these, these devices or, 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 or these uh, robots. Now, something very important then also happened in uh, 2010 um, um, when I was asked to, to, to um, get a permit from the Director for Conventional Arms Control to actually allow me to develop these drones now. For those of us who don't know, um, South Africa is a signatory to uh, um, uh, an agreement called the Vasnar Arrangement. And within uh, this uh, arrangement, it talks about dual use goods and, and technologies and drones are termed in section nine of this document as a, a, a dual use uh, a technology or dual use goods um, in, in the sense that it can obviously be used uh, um, 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 as a transport system or delivery system for WMD or biological weapons in, in that sense. And because South Africa is a, a signatory to this agreement, um, um, they established uh, the Director for Conventional Arms Control um, and uh, the, the policy document is, is, is just shown here as well. And I then registered um, I'm with DCAC and I then obtained permits to develop these drones and also uh, to market them as well. Uh, in 2010, one of my master's students at the time developed the first morphing wing uh, this aircraft or our laboratory prototype aircraft and uh, it was quite successful in that we uh, could then reduce the ground roll by, by about 29% and increase uh, um, um, the, um, the climb rate of, of, of this vehicle by just flexing and changing the shape of the wings for a specific type of uh, a flight regime or environment. Also in that year, um, we developed a computational tool uh, that has uh, specific inputs related to uh, the type of payload uh, that it carries, the range and the endurance. And based on those three inputs, it will provide a preliminary design for an aircraft. That was then used to develop our second generation, a drone called Guardian 2. And these are just uh, some videos as well uh, showing Guardian 2. A few months after that, we completed Gu uh, Guardian 2, the B version, and this had shorter wings for more maneuverability, and it could also be launched off a catapult and also retrieved uh, with a, a parachute. And all of these technologies were designed within my laboratory. In 2013, my unit was incorporated into the uh, technology, innovation, te technology Innovation Agency's uh, Technology Station program, and it became the 18th technology station in South Africa. Our Guardian 3, or our third generation, uh, a Guardian was then also developed in 2013. And in 2014, uh, we had our fourth generation uh, drone also developed. 
early 2015, I was given the opportunity to take uh, uh, my team and one of our airframes to one of the game farms in KwaZulu Natal, essentially to set it up uh, uh, for anti-poaching missions in that specific game farm. Um, and it was in that year that the South African Civil Aviation Authority uh, came out with, with, with their new drone regulations and grounded all drone operations. We then took that, uh, came back to the lab, and essentially used the same airframe and developed application-specific uh, drones um, 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 for uh, specific applications, as I said, a fire and rescue, a drone essentially operating as a spotter, uh, anti-poaching uh, drone, the blue one, um, inland border patrol, the brown one, and of course, uh, maritime patrol, uh, um, um, the gray one over there. Now, at the same time, we then also developed our own flight computer, um, um, as well as a hardware in the loop simulator. Um, and, and this just shows an image of that. And it had a mathematical model of our aircraft uh, uh, uploaded or built into the, the, the simulator as well. Now, everything that happened up until 2017 was basically on my own steam. The initial developments uh, all happened uh, due to my uh, personal funding. My wife was not too happy with that, but in any case, uh, she saw the dream. Um, and in 2017, however, uh, I joined force, forces with the Department of Environmental Affairs, and they had a specific objective there of developing a drone um, um, for animal sensors or apex, uh, apex predator monitoring. And uh, the work then focused on developing uh, operations uh, 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 development uh, program uh, for the team that operates the drone, um, 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 as well as a, a new airframe, essentially, uh, for this uh, animal sensors application. Um, CPUT then also got permission to, to, to use Somerset Air Force, uh, Somersfeld Air Force Base, the, uh, which is located just outside of Darling. And then we also developed our in-house virtual bird um, um, and I'll talk about that a bit later on as well. My team then uh, became known as uh, um, the Animal Census team, and I developed quite a nice patch for that, I, I, I think so. In 2018, um, we then uh, got registrations from Civil Aviation Authority for four of our airframes, and then towards, towards the end of 2018, um, we then took part uh, um, um, in one of our first missions with environmental affairs to actually uh, um, um, uh, do the monitoring of, of birds at, at Lampards Bay um, um, and do a bird count. And th there was quite a lot of interesting things that, that came out of that, that first mission. Sorry, so the, the, this just shows the, the virtual bird as it, as, as it stands. This is our avionics box with our control looms or our electrical looms, and you'll see it uh, being connected to um, um, the actual simulator. And that was then used to, uh, to, to perform virtual missions um, and also provide some type of training to people operating our drone. Um, these are some of the, 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 the uh, patents uh, that were filed in 2019. Um, and it looked at uh, quite a range of technologies that was developed in that year for, for, for that specific airframe as well. This just shows uh, Somersfeld Air Force Base, um, and we refurbished the, the, the control tower uh, for our specific needs as well. Now, using Somersfeld, we then provide, uh, develop a, a radio communications and operations procedure uh, for our drone. And this, uh, the video that is here just, just shows some of the, 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 the testing of that specific program as well. Um, very importantly though, is that the flight procedures uh, that we developed was in line with Civil Aviation Authority at the time. And this was before they had the beyond visual line of sight uh, of flying operations. And it essentially consisted out of five uh, specific headings um, um, from the pre-flight uh, briefing all the way to post-flight briefing. And within that, having your, your pre-flight procedures with 27 main procedures, 16 sub procedures, your takeoff and airborne uh, uh, conditions, um, having your 20 main procedures there. And then for the application specific uh, or mission specific uh, procedures, uh, that would also 
be included and then of course uh, the landing as well. So within my lab, I have what is known as a ground simulator as well as a control room uh, simulator and the team that operates uh, our driver uh, flight control or the, 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 the commander radio control, the avionics controller and then the pilot and the ground controller as well. And this is how we, we essentially perform these virtual missions uh, um, um, anywhere in South Africa, uh, um, um, uh, putting them through their paces and the beauty of the simulator is that we can introduce faults into the, 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 the actual airframe while it's flying to see how the team will, will cope uh, um, 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 with those specific um, 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 uh, changes uh, that was made to, to, to the actual mission. So overall, um, in terms of, of what we have at CPT now, um, is the entire suite of offerings uh, to, to, to operate the RPAS. So that goes from the air, the, the, the air vehicle development all the way to uh, training of specific airframes with specific applications as well. And, and all of these elements over here has been done uh, with, with, within, my, uh, within my unit as well. CPT has also then um, established a, a company uh, to commercialize the, the, the sorry, uh, to commercialize uh, the actual technologies. And I'll talk about that just a little bit later on. But um, I, I'm going to speak a little bit about these technology uh, readiness levels, going from one all the way to, to nine. And essentially when, when you develop any type of technology, uh, this is the scale that's used to to check the, the maturity or, or, or the, yeah, the, the level of maturity at each of the different development phases. And it starts off with basic technology research all the way uh, up to your system test and operations. And if we use this uh, scale uh, or technology readiness level scale um, and, and, and see how uh, my program is actually developed, um, um, you will see, for example, from 95 to 2007, that, that was our initial uh, um, 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 research uh, focus in establishing a capability uh, in, in uh, aircraft design, uh, uh, manufacturing, testing uh, um, from 2008 to 2011, I would say that then focused primarily on the technology development uh, from 2012 to 2017, uh, looked at the engineering development. And then of course, uh, 2018 uh, to present using the, the, the actual the, uh, um, um, airframe for specific tests and, and, and demonstration. And of course, looking forward to, to um, future opportunities to actually use the system um, in South Africa for South African uh, specific problems. Now, in terms of um, 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 current research, and this is just one of the projects that, 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 that uh, I'm involved in at the moment, um, SOMI technology, this has been something that I've been passionate about. Also, I would say probably since 2006. Um, um, and what we have today really is uh, just examples of masses of, of, of these little uh, uh, mini drones or, or Pico drones. And uh, the, the video that is shown here really shows uh, one of the world records uh, uh, um, um, that was broken in, in uh, September 2020. Um, and essentially, uh, this is not so many technology, it's essentially programming these little robots to follow a specific path. And uh, what these guys then did was uh, to create these various light shows with the drones. Now, swarming technology in its true sense um, um, really is mimicked from your biological creatures like birds and fish. And there's quite a lot of intelligence in uh, um, um, what actually happens when a swarm moves. So my journey, as I said, started around about 2006, um, um, but uh, the actual hardware for it uh, started in, in 1618, um, um, where we essentially developed a hybrid, a vertical takeoff and landing fixed wing aircraft to act as the delivery uh, uh, system for smaller drones. Um, and at the same time then, we also developed what is known as an autonomous docking and undocking uh, uh, system with the idea that your, your, your VTOL will fly to a specific area, go into a hover, and then release these smaller drones uh, where the smaller drones then undock. Uh, they go do a specific mission. 
They then come back to the, the, the mother drone, if you want to call it that. Uh, they, they, they dock with the mother drone and the mother drone then brings them all back. So the idea there is, is that uh, the research is at the PhD level, but I have uh, um, a master's and, and, and bachelor's students involved in this project, obviously working on, on various components of it, but integrating uh, based obviously on artificial intelligence with machine learning and deep learning algorithms uh, uh, into uh, the, uh, basically program into these uh, um, um, little drones specifically for the application of collaborative uh, surveillance. So if you just look at, at what was achieved over uh, this, this period that I've been involved just in, in, in the drone technology, obviously skills and human capital development, uh, skills transfer, tech development, tech transfer, innovation, technology, localization, and of course, commercialization. Now, CPT has established this company called Promerops, PTY Limited. And in 2017, I established a company called Cosile, uh, uh, Cusela Isiswe Technology and Engineering, also to, to commercialize uh, the, the, the technologies uh, that was developed there. And that essentially is my uh, founder story. Kim, I hope I didn't go over my time, uh, but thank you. <laughs> Professor, thank you so much. Um, while you were presenting, I was making notes about questions I was going to ask, and then you answered the question, <laughs> and, uh, and then again and again. And um, wow, that busy slide, um, I think, could keep us all busy for five hours. What Absolutely. a remarkable journey. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, thank you. So let me quickly see, we are slightly over, but we're, we're absolutely still fine, I believe. Let me see if there are any questions. Um, admins, are there any questions? In the meantime, Professor, for, for our viewers and, and listeners out there, and I think these are being recorded for, um, for later reference, if you, knowing what you know now, and this is an incredible journey, and for, for someone like me, you know, who is in a company who's doing some of these things, I'm like, wow, okay, that is just, um, you know, hugely remarkable. If you know what you know now, um, or now that you know what you know now, what, would you have done anything differently at the beginning of your journey, or even throughout? Kim, you know, I, I, you know, to a certain extent, I, I probably didn't have a choice um, um, be, be, because if, if you look at CPT's history itself and, and the Technicon as well, um, um, it, it, it really, uh, it, 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 there was almost a symbiotic relationship that I had with, with, with my institution because we had to move forward. We had to get to, 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 to a point where research in some or other form, especially in my department, had to be established. And the mathematics really was the key to unlocking all of that. Um, um, and um, out of that came not just the drone program, but I also established the motorsport program, a maritime platforms development program. And now lately for COVID, uh, we also developed or, or are developing medical uh, technology specifically to, to, uh, to fight uh, the, uh, the spread of the pandemic. And like I said, all of it is based on mathematics. And if you see the world uh, uh, through, through, through mathematics eyes, if, if I can call it that, you can achieve basically anything. <laughs> and a drone becomes a, 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 a coastal vehicle, becomes a motor car, becomes whatever. So I didn't really have a choice. It, 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 it was a really exciting uh, uh, period. Uh, um, and I, I, I can just feel lucky to, to, to have been part of that development as well. Fantastic. This is where I wish I had concentrated more in my mathematics classes in high school. <laughs> when, when, you, when you put up all those sheets of formulas, my eyes glazed over, but I, I, I would often, and I echo what you're saying, and I would say this to young entrepreneurs, or at least people that are still in the, you know, in their academic phase, Mathematics, right, is is a key thing for for um, for so many applications and and so many streams that one can go into. So, um, Professor, thank you so so much. I think if there are any more questions, 
Um, we can always feed them through afterwards. But I would, um, I would thank you uh, again. Um, so nice to meet you eventually. Yes, and I think if I'm um, able to, I don't know what the administrators behind the scenes are going to switch over. I'm now going to introduce our second speaker. Thank you so much, Professor. No problem. Okay. So my friend Gift, are we on? Can we see your face? Hi, good to see you. Good to see you too. I am now going to hand over um, to Gift Khadema, who, uh, Khadema, sorry, um, who is the co-founder and chief executive officer of um, Nafazi Zaangani and um, Gift, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kim. Uh, if you just allow me, I'll just quickly share my screen as well. Uh, but uh, I'm just so excited to be actually part of the conversation. I think it's a conversation that uh, you know, we continually need to have, especially if you want to drive innovation uh, in, in South Africa. Uh, so thank you very much for the opportunity. And I think for me, my side was to basically tell my story to try and encourage maybe a few people in the audience uh, who are thinking of trying to get involved in the drone space you know, how they can actually get it, uh, you know, being a startup and how to navigate some of the challenges which we've gone through. So I think uh, just to, you know, uh, give the audience a bit of a brief overview in terms of what Nafasti does, I've just prepared a, a quick presentation that will allow, uh, outline, you know, uh, some of the technology offering which we provide uh, to, to our cost, uh, customers. So initially our company actually started in 2018. Um, and I think, you know, we had such big visions, such big dreams. Uh, and one of the things that we wanted to do was to how do we actually harness drone technology to play a role in the African continent. Uh, and so we just initially started and bought, and bought ourselves a little uh, uh, Mavic with my uh, business partners, uh, Sean and Caesar. Uh, and, you know, we we're so excited about the technology and we thought that we could take over the world with this little Mavic that we had. And literally that's where it stemmed from. But at the same time, we were also understanding that, you know, with the world and how it's transitioning, and I love it how, you know, Peter Diamantis puts it, uh, who was actually one of the, uh, the chairman of the X Prize. He says that in the next 10 years, you know, there are going to be two kinds of companies that will be using AI and those that are bankrupt. And so we said, okay, how can we assist, you know, companies within the African context to harness the AI technology so that they can be able to you not know, be the companies which are essentially bankrupt. And that's where the vision actually stemmed from. And it was pretty simple from us, you know, we wanted to become a, the world leading uh, drone company, not only drone com company, but a data company, you know, a company that would harness drone technology as one of the tools uh, within the toolbox to collect the data, process the data, then analyze the data. And then by so doing, we're able to give, you know, our clients the insights to be able to take the necessary means uh, and also the necessary steps, you know, to make sure that they are compliant, they are safe, uh, and they're actually able to take decisions which make sense then and there. So we wanted to give them real-time data as well as real-time insights. And so we founded the company in 2018 and we started on this journey. And, you know, over the years, we've actually revolved and we saw ourselves playing a space in the, in, in, in the construction sector. You know, uh, when, when the construction sector, it was actually in a recession process, uh, you know, a lot of the companies and a lot of the, uh, the so-called big five construction companies were having some challenges internally. Um, and also looking in terms of the African context, you know, we are so behind with regards to our infrastructure. And we saw ourselves playing a role specifically in, in the construction space and assisting some of the companies uh, to be able to build faster, you know, companies to be able to uh, make sure that even in the development, they're also, you know, taking on uh, digital tools uh, because that's where the world essentially is going and effectively to make them work smarter. And uh, there was a study that was actually put up, which was quite interesting. And it looked at, you know, what are the technologies that are changing uh, the construction space at large? And built, uh, built information modeling was one of them, you know, big data and the, and, and, and the analytics of that data, you know, project management and how do you actually do project management in an effective way? So those information systems and how they can actually be incorporated and also mobile devices and mobile platforms. You know, we see in the African context now, 
uh, or the African continent rather, you know, making use of our mobile devices uh, and also being able to have access to smart devices, uh, which also, you know, was one of the key things that the, the report found that will actually revolutionize the construction sector. And the most exciting one, which is the topic of the day, is actually drones. And so we said, okay, with the company that we're going to start, you know, we've been transitioning and using drone technology to, uh, to, to be able to assist uh, construction professionals. And over time, we gradually started to also look into some of the, uh, the, 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 the disruptive technologies that we, we uh, utilize, which is, you know, built environment modeling, which is something that now we also offer internally. And, you know, for us, it was, okay, now we've got all of these various uh, disruptive technologies, but the most key and, and, and component thing that we were trying to address was how can you know, the end user be able to manage his site remotely? Because one of them, uh, you know, the, the, the consulting management gurus in the world was Peter Draker. He said that essentially you can't manage what you can't measure. And our technology was actually formulated to assist those to be able to measure what's going on on the site and take the necessary actions in a much more quicker uh, and, and, and faster manner. And just quickly and briefly, you know, this was some of the service offering which we offer at our company. But even before we got to this place, you know, as a startup, I would encourage the guys is try find yourself a niche which you think you'll be able to service. Because when we started with our little Mavic, uh, you know, we wanted to do everything. We wanted to do photography, we wanted to do weddings, we wanted to, I mean, the, 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 there were so many things that we wanted to do. And quickly we had to realize that, you know, you cannot be the jack of all trades because you're not going to be able to service, you know, your customers much more. And in this day and age, customers actually want to have a, uh, a, a good and a refined uh, relationship with the service provider. You know, they want to be able to have, you know, a customer service, which is tailored for their needs and you can't do everything. And, you know, I think that's one of the key things that which we learned in our journey and quickly realized that find a place where you think there's a gap and nurture your skills and become good at what you actually want to service the client in. And these are some of the service offerings that ultimately when we started with a big you know, uh, cloud of what we wanted to do, we refined it to, to these three uh, components which we understood would be able to uh, you know, assist our clients. And so we looked at the as-built monitoring, you know, how can professionals build and understand what's going on site in real time. We looked at infrastructure management, you know, infrastructure management, there's a lot of decaying infrastructure, you know, uh, in the African context, but how can we actually collect data to be able to manage that infrastructure properly? And one of the key, you know, offerings in that uh, specific product is we allow our clients to do predictive analysis so they can understand in terms of when do they need to do ma maintenance and how they should do maintenance as well. And then another key one was data processing, you know, how can we be able to incorporate the various data which is collected on the site process it and then it can be able to give our clients key insights as well as real insights. Just to look at a typical example, you know, you look at Mudupi and Kusile, you know, these are big, 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 big projects, you know, and this is not just only uh, from, you know, the uh, uh, Kusile as well as Mudupi perspective, but there are a number of construction projects which actually struggle. And, you know, 451 uh, billion rands was what the project overruns was when, you know, we initially found, uh, uh, when we were initially uh, getting the report in terms of the overrun cost for that specific project. And both of the projects had an average overrun of six years. You know, if you look at 451 billion rands in an African context, how many schools can that build? You know, how many clinics can that build? You know, and so that was also one of the visions is how can we make sure that we progress the African context by, you know, eradicating or assisting the professionals who are building the construction sites, eradicate, you know, cost overruns, which where the budgets can be funneled into, you know, developing schools and clinics and overall improving the well-being of those who actually occupy, you know, the specific townships or whatever the case may be. I'm not going to, you know, touch on, on, on some of the, the, the features, but this is what uh, some of the service offering within the products offer to our clients. Earthwork management, you know, volumetric calculation and analyzing that. And I think also one of the key things which I'd like to touch on as well, you know, uh, which you'll see is uh, talking about the process of how we assist our clients is you have to come up with standard operating procedures. All right. Everything has to be in line and you have to have a standard and you have to have a, 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 a way of actually measuring how you measure your standard. 
And I think that's one of the challenges that we also struggled with. You know, we didn't understand how can we standardize what we do from start all the way to finish. And more often than not, we had challenges with our clients, you know, not being clear in terms of what they wanted, you know, not being, uh, giving them data essentially, which is what they didn't even want in the first place. And we quickly realized that, okay, we have to be able to standardize everything in a simple way. And even in that simple way, we are able to measure each and every single step, you know. And if you look at the as built uh, monitoring uh, uh, product, which we saw is we understand, okay, we have to capture the data. Then there's a specific set of requirements in terms of how do we capture the data? When we process the data, okay, we need to process it so that it's actually in specific file format. Then we understand how we need to process that data and we are measured according to that, according to the standard operating procedures. And then also one of the things is, okay, how are we gonna allow the clients to be able to consume the data? You know, So then we quickly realize, okay, giving a client you know, a USB, you know, yes, it, it can be that, but what if the client is down in Cape Town? It's not feasible to, you know, send a USB all the way from Gauteng down to Cape Town. So now we need to create a platform, which is also standard of them being able to access the data. So, you know, as a startup and um, come up with those standard operating procedures and measure each and every single process so that over time you can find the efficiencies and how you can become much more efficient with each and every single step. So that's one of the things that I would actually also stress on, you know, from, from, from assisting you guys to be able to refine and, and become efficient within your business. And then the structure management as well, infrastructure management is also quite a big thing, which we, we saw for some of the uh, you know, um, uh, challenges which our clients faced. And we quickly understood that what our clients' problems are, we must be able to assist them in a quickly and timeless manner, okay? And this was one of the lessons as well, which I'd like to share with the clients. I mean, with the panel today, as well as the, the attendees is, understand and know what your client actually wants. You know, more often than not, I think as startups, you come up with brilliant ideas, which at the end of the day are not meaningful to the end user or to the client. So this product came up, you know, by understanding what the client actually wants, by engaging with the client, uh, you know, on an on a, on a, on a, um, often basis. So listen to your client. I think that's one of the key things that I'd like to stress on today. Listen to your client, understand what their needs are and come up with solutions that are tailored to addressing their problems, because essentially that's who you're servicing as a client and you have to quickly understand them. And it also works in the same process as well. And you know, within that specific product, we also had to come up with uh, standard operating procedures so that we can be able to be measured uh, accordingly. And then also another one as well, which is another, another uh, you know, uh, thing that I'd like to share with the, with the attendees today is how this product came about. So data processing was, okay, we understood that there are also many other drone companies which are having challenges and don't necessarily understand uh, you know, how to actually effectively service their clients. And one of the key components we understood, okay, it's very easy for someone to get access to a drone, but the data was a critical part, okay? And by so understanding that, and also you know, talking and engaging with other startups, we quickly understood that there's a big problem, you know, in terms of not understanding what's, uh, how to process the data. And we said, okay, this is actually an opportunity. And we maximize on that opportunity because we had to really understand what it takes to get the data, process the data, and also send the data to the client. And there was a lot of challenges which we came up with. And we said, okay, since from the lessons that we've learned, we do want to assist other startups as well in the ecosystem to be able to not go through the same problems which we've done. And so we came up with this product, which was also identifying you know, uh, an opportunity in, in the market. And so I think one of the, the key things as well I'd like to share is once you've become so good you know, in terms of understanding what the client's needs are, you know, find other opportunities as well uh, within the market, which will essentially allow you to grow, all right? But also that growth has to be measured. More often than not, I think was one of the problems which we also struggled with is we wanted to quickly enter new markets, but not understanding you know, how to actually go about it effectively. And so by engaging with other startups and also engaging with other companies, we quickly understood that here's an opportunity. We investigated that opportunity further, and then it made it a plausible case that we can be able to service and address uh, some of these opportunities, uh, which are the startups which we're facing. And we also quickly uh, came up with a, a standard operating procedure. I wanted to demonstrate a video, but I was having some technical issues 
uh, with regards to the video that I wanted to play, uh, it was it was not actually downloading and playing off my slide, but it was just a demo, just to demonstrate, you know, in terms of how far we've come and what the journey looked like, and also uh, what is the product offering that we're actually offering and the lessons that were were, were were understood throughout the whole process. But if you would like to see that video, you know, you can more than welcome go to, to, to our website uh, and it's up there for you guys to actually see. And from that as well, you'll understand in terms of, okay, what were some of the benefits uh, which we addressed, you know, to some of our, our, our clients by going through this journey was, you know, we could effectively allow our clients to work much more smarter, work much more efficiently, uh, and overall, you know, to be able to make sure that their site is safe. And these were some of the benefits that were, were, were given to our clients through our service offering. And I think it, this is, is also one of the key things that I'd like to share with the panelists as well is once you understand what your clients needs, all right, you have to always ensure that the benefit is there. It does not end, um, you know, by giving a, a client a service which is beneficial to him once off, but understand from that specific service offering, how much more value can you give to him so that it's beneficial to him actually buying your product? Um, you know, the benefits should not end uh, at, at, at one specific point, but as you engage more with your clients, keep on adding to the list of benefits, uh, which will ultimately allow your clients to be, to come back to your, uh, to your service offering. Because that's one of the key things. As a startup, try to find as much recurring revenue as possible, because you want to be able to have a lot of runway and by having a lot of runway and by having a lot of money within uh, you know, your bank, that will allow you to go out into the market and try to find more customers. So you have to be beneficial to the first few clients that you find so that you can have that recurring revenue, which will you know, keep you afloat and keep you running for, for, for quite an extensive time. And you know, I think uh, that's, that's, that's some of the things that I'd like to share. Um, you know, in terms of how effectively can you guys go through the journey of being a startup, understanding your clients, you know, making sure that when you service your clients, uh, you know, you, you, you learn and you come up with standing operating procedures and within those standing operating procedures, measure yourself so that you can become more efficient overall. Uh, but I must say it's been quite an, exciteful, uh, an exciting journey. Uh, it's a journey that I would encourage everyone to get involved in. If you're looking into the drone space, it's quite exciting. If you see what some of the companies globally are doing, you'll, you'll see that it's actually quite an exciting space to get involved in. And I think from an African context, we need to find solutions which are African tailored and which address the African problems uh, from an African context. And I encourage everyone who's thinking of getting involved in the drone, in the drone te technology and into the drone space, don't think twice get involved and we're more than willing to connect and assist you uh, wherever we can. Thank you very much. Gift, you are such an inspiration and it's always such a pleasure to hear you speak. And I'm sure the viewers that are on today will have taken so much um, from your presentation. So well done. Um, I'm just waiting to see if the team behind the scenes have any questions from the audience. But in the meantime, Gift, what would you say from a startup ecosystem perspective, specifically at the ideas stage? Because that is where a lot of our young entrepreneurs or our young um, technical, you know, peeps and, and people who are just trying to find something cool to do and seeing this as an opportunity are sitting thinking, what in the drone space can I do? You know, and, and these all these ideas come up because you Google and you see 50 and 100 and 150 applications and they go, right, here's an idea. Now, what advice would you have for these, these individuals at that stage yeah, when they're yeah. coming up with ideas, what's the key thing they need to remember? I think the key thing is surround yourself, uh, you know, with a community that will sharpen your skills and also give you a full understanding of what's being done for programs. We were privileged to be part of the Mzansi Aerospace uh, Accelerator Program. And I think that really refined, you know, our ideas and really allowed us to focus, you know, as you were saying that there are so many things that you can Google and you can get caught up in the world when you're trying to do everything. So I would say, you know, try find, accelerate, find communities which you can learn from, 
uh, that can actually validate what you're trying to do. And then by so doing and, and, and validating your idea, then in that ideation stage, then you can try to put in a bit of money once you've gotten a bit of validation and try in terms of understanding, you know, what is the core problem that are we addressing uh, and how can I go about it best? I know there's a number of, you know, uh, free online uh, um, uh, schools as well, like the Y Combinator. Uh, I'd also recommend that that will allow you to validate your, 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 your solution or the problem that you're trying to address. So validate it and then try and understand how can I break into the market through that solution. Thanks, Gift. It's that validation part, right? Um, Palisha, I can see Victor has his hand up. Um, would you be able to unmute him? I think Victor will most likely have a, a good question or follow-up comment. Can I go ahead? You can go ahead, Victor. I see you've been unmuted. <laughs> yeah, Gift. Um, it's such a pleasure listening to you and, um, and uh, Kim, for you also being a great host. And uh, uh, what Gift is, uh, Kim, Gift is a, is a great teacher and a student <laughs> at the same time. I've learned quite a lot from him. And um, particularly when it comes to this example about Meduki. But give just a question for me. Um, you've been not only in the drone industry, but also you 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 come from uh, what do you guys call it now? Uncrewed uh, or the <laughs> yeah, this, yeah, we, we haven't figured that out yet. <laughs> okay, we are not, we we are not uncrewed. We just drone industry. Okay, uh, you come from the conventional aviation industry, and uh, and you now in this space. Uh, just a question for me. How did you make that transition and how do you find yourself? Because in the main aviation, uh, it's all about moving people and goods. And that's it, uh, pri primarily. How have you transitioned and how is the uncrewed, sorry, the drone industry, uh, uh, where you see it, your perspective right now and the way you see it going in the next 10 to 20 years? Thanks. Uh, thank, thanks a lot for the question, Victor. I think it's 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 quite a, a great question, and it's quite an interesting question, which you know I I continually you know as I read up more and see what's going on, that answer keeps on being refined. But you know what made my transition was you know at the time you know I was reading a lot and trying to understand where the aviation space was going, and it was a time where you know Boeing as well as uh, Airbus, the two biggest aircraft manufacturers, were testing unmanned aircraft. You know. And for me, it was like, okay, if the two biggest manufacturers are trying to drive unmanned crew aircraft, then clearly, you know, the whole industry is going to change because in most cases, the two biggest manufacturers sort of can to a certain degree shape, I mean, shape society. And at the same time, I was seeing that the drone space was starting to come in and it was, you know, something that was very exciting technology. Uh, and I realized that, okay, unmanned, and Boeing is trying to get into the unmanned space. So clearly this is where it's actually going. And as the more I read up, I started to see a lot of e-mobility, you know, technology starting to come into play. And I realized actually, this is where we wanna invest our energy. You know, this is where I think, uh, you know, I would, I would play a contribution, um, you know, and also become, you know, an, an, an expert in that space because it was fairly something new. And, you know, just to answer the question about where do I see it in the next 10 you know, to 20 years, I think it's, it's only a matter of time once you jump into an aircraft, which is not piloted. You know, I think it's, 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 it's literally just a matter of time that happens. I think with the millennials as well as generation, you know, as, um, X, they think differently, you know, they're more prone to taking risk. It's, you know, I think uh, the baby boomers in the previous generation who will not be comfortable in jumping into an aircraft but I look at my little sisters, you know, they they would do it in a flash, you know. So I think it's a matter of time. I think that's where the, the space is going, you know. And also looking at some of the companies like Joby, uh, you know, which list, uh, recently listed on the stock uh, on the um, on the uh, New York Stock Exchange, you know, we're seeing a lot of these things that are coming into play where you know um, uh, uh, e, e mobility is going to play a role. And I think it's, it's it's going to change. It's only a matter of time where you won't be jumping into a vehicle, but you'll be jumping into an aircraft even an unmanned aircraft to travel from Pretoria to Joburg. I think that's where it's going in the next uh, 10 to 20 years. And it's quite an exciting uh, transition uh, um, that will be happening. 
but I'm, I'm always open to uh, to a debate because <laughs> it's yeah it's quite an interesting question I I, I don't say my answer is correct but it's yeah it's, it's an interesting conversation to have gift you you have such a succinct um way of talking about your journey right from you know the the day you walked into Mzanzi's um incubator program to your future views on things and it's just so inspiring well done that was a good good answer and yeah like you say debates right who knows where this is going to go um yeah. there is a question on the on the chat or on the q a it's from james loxton and he says, have you extended your client offering in the construction space to security? And if so, how? Thieves on site of building, uh, yeah, it's basically, you know, addressing the issue of um, uh, crime on, on uh, building sites, you know, removing building materials, et cetera. Yeah, I think, you know, um, this was also one of the things that we had to educate our clients is, you know, a drone is not necessarily going to solve all of your problems. Um, and if you look at the construction space, you know, uh, typically a construction site is is not fairly big. You know, you're looking at nothing more than, uh, you know, um, uh, two, 12 hectares, maybe 15 hectares, you know, if you're looking at tall construction buildings. And it's much more cost effective just to put up CCTV cameras, you know. Um, and I think that's one of the, the things I'd also encourage the, the, the attendees is, you know, a drone cannot solve all of your problems. It's about understanding, you know, what is the actual problem I'm trying to solve and what are the best tools to allow me to solve that problem. So we haven't expanded in the construction space to address, you know, the criminal theft because from a cost perspective, it, it does not make sense. It would be better just to put up a, uh, you know, static CCTV cameras and monitor that and maybe have two extra guards uh, who will do more frequent patrols. Okay, thanks for answering that. We have um, a few more minutes for you, Gift. Um, what advice would you give anyone um, who is in an incubator program um, or some form of program to really take advantage of everything that's offered, right? Because a lot of people have the privilege of of getting or are lucky enough to get onto a program a lot of people aren't um but that's not where it stops right Th that's kind of one step up so what what ad advice would you have for those lucky enough to to get in um to make to take full advantage of of what's on offer yeah i i think it's just participation here um i think it's once you're there you know give it your all you know participate in all ways possible, you know, uh, you know, try to, you know, uh, to get as much from the program as possible. Just don't go there and attend for the sake of being there, but participate, get involved. And another thing as well is read, read, read. You know, once you're in there, you definitely have to read and, and have to try and understand as much as possible. Um, that's the only way that you will, you know, um, broaden your perspective. You know, uh, you know, this is the only way just by merely reading and also participating and not just being an attendee, but participating and get involved. Yeah, get involved. It's like I always say, get your arms around it, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, okay, there's a question and then we've also got a hand up. So let me, let me read the question for you. It's quite a long one. So um, this is from, I hope I'm pronouncing this correctly, Dwayne Kellerman. You mentioned that when you drum down and dive into the niche that you are able to service, you have to have a standard for means of procedure. You have to have a way to measure that standard and then keep to that standard. How do you then come up with a, with a system which you can turn into that standard? How far do you take trial and error? Good question. Yeah, no, that's 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 really that's really a great question, um, and you know I think with being a startup, you can't necessarily afford a lot of the digital tools that are available that can assist with the standardization. And so what we did is we used what was available to us, you know, Word and Excel, and we drafted a lot of procedures and kept on refining them. Um, and you know we also kept metrics, you know. So uh, a typical example is. Okay, we knew that uh, 16 hectares or 100 hectares of data 
takes us a certain amount of time to process. And we knew, okay, this is what it took us the previous time. And we kept it on an Excel sheet, okay? How can we improve it? And then we kept on measuring until we got so better that we could churn out data much more quicker. So I think as a startup, you know, don't necessarily try and procure the most expensive system or digital platform to allow you to come up with the standards, but have, you know, a template on Word, have, you know, a, a, a procedure on Excel and how to measure yourself in that. And then once you understand that, then you can go into the market because you know what's required regarding your standard and what works for you, then you can look for a tool that best will suit how you work. Because one of the things is, and I think this is what I'm, what I'm telling you now comes from us, we bought a solution which we thought would assist us only to find out that it did just 10% of what we required. So we went back the old way, you know, come up with it manually and then look for something that will meet our needs. Uh, so I hope that that answers the question from, from the panel. Thanks, Gift. Okay, so um, James has got his hand up. I know, James, um, I know this is going to be a good question. We'll take that one last question, and then we're going to go um, to our third speaker. So, James, um, go ahead, and Palisha, if you can unmute James, please. Hi there, guys. I think it might be a, a little hiccup. It says it's not James, it's Armand. I don't know how that might have happened. Oh, okay. Hi. <laughs> I just want to say Go ahead. You, um, and then from Gift side, um, just watching uh, your slides and hearing your story from where you came from, it's it's very inspirational. Uh, coming from my side now as well as a young entrepreneur, um, having been given a, a great opportunity recently. Um, I wanted to ask from your perspective, uh, being in the drone industry, um, something that I've researched so far and that I've found is that um, with us going into the drone industry, we need to be able to become airborne, to trial and error our software and our services we want to deliver. Um, however, I've noticed that having to go through the rules and regulations um, that we have with our CA and everything, it's it's quite hampering. It's, it's a bit of a hiccup for the new entrepreneurs to get into. Um, what type of advice could you give from your side um, that you think we could utilize as young entrepreneurs to be able to better enter that market? Because I know it's it's very time constrained and it could quite become quite expensive as, as well. Um, what could you give from your side to maybe ease that up for young new entrepreneurs that want to start up their ideas to, yeah. to be able to get into that market? Yeah, no, Armand, that's a, that's, that's a phenomenal question, actually. I think um, it's, it's, it's really a great question. And what we did is, you know, we initially, like I said, bought <laughs> this little Mavic, and then we quickly realized that, okay, the regulations are, <laughs> are not going to allow us to be able to, 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 to address some of those issues. And so what we did is we quickly looked at the, uh, at the landscape of the drone space, and we contacted a lot of the guys to try and come up with strategic partners which already had ROCs, you know, uh, a remote operator certificate, uh, and that were allowed to operate illegally. Um, and you know, I think try and see what you're trying to address, and then look at the at the ROCs that are available and see which ones specialize, you know, with the, within that specific niche that you're trying to enter. And I know for a fact that you know all of the the, the ROC holders are always willing and open, you know, to engage with any. Uh, with any person who, who who might want to be able to you know fly underneath them uh, it's just a matter of finding the right partnership uh, and having a strategic partner that will allow you uh, to be able to you know enter into the market because yeah it's quite expensive and uh, if you look at how quickly the technology is, is 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 evolving by the time you apply for your roc and you've got a matrice 300 by the time you receive your roc that's already a legacy system you know, so exactly. It's, exactly. It's, it's, yeah, it's, it's a bit of a challenge, but what I would always encourage is try to find strategic partners um, that will allow you to be able to test. Uh, you know, the ROC holders are always more than willing uh, to assist um, where, wherever possible. Perfect. Thanks a lot for that, Gift. I really appreciate it. Pleasure. Thank you, Gift. Um, you have such a maturity about you, and I can absolutely tell, and I think those participants participants will, will also really benefit from the fact that you really have gotten your arms around this industry. So well done. You, you really are 
um, such a treat to chat to and listen to. So, and by the way, guys, definitely um, go onto Nafazi's website and go and look at that video um, that of, of the journey. It's, um, it's very cool to watch. Um, Armand, please get in touch with me afterwards. I can try and connect you to some people as well and try and see if we can help you, okay? Thanks, Dr. Kim. We'll definitely do that. All right, brilliant. Um, Gift, thank you so thank much. You. We're going thank to move much. on to our third speaker. You take care of yourself and we'll speak to you soon. Thank you very much. So, Appreciate it. Um, that was a nice interactive session. So I have the pleasure of now introducing our last speaker for this session, Mr. Victor Adebe founder of Nzanzi Aerospace Technologies and South Africa's first drone accelerator program. Victor, the floor is yours. The floor in the cloud. Hi, Kim. Thank you so much for your time. And um, it's always lovely to talk to you and uh, Gift and all the other uh, who I call ecosystem builders, um, Sam, who is also in the in the meeting. Um, I'm just going to do my my quick presentation, and uh, and then we can have a discussion. I just realized that uh, uh, Kim, I have to have a hard stop at three o'clock because uh, I'm supposed to see a doctor and can only see me now. Sorry, sorry about that. <laughs> No, we'll um, we'll be no, we're we're in we're in good time. It depends how long your presentation is, but go ahead. That's twenty minutes. Okay. Perfect. I, I think Kim, I'm going to talk more probably about the whole issue around startup ecosystem or what you call um, uh, entrepreneurship ecosystem, whichever way you want to call it. But uh, just so that uh, those um, aspiring entrepreneurs in this call and also everybody else uh, probably who is a, an ecosystem builder, like uh, Prof. Uh, Philander, thank you very much for your presentation. And uh, I've been following everyone when I talk about drone hard technology, they always refer me to CPUT and uh, you guys are doing amazing work. And I'd like to believe that uh, when things settle to level zero, we can come down to Western Cape to, for us to uh, look at some of the amazing work that you are doing. Okay, um, my talk is going to be on these four topics and um, start off by talking about the drone industry update. I'm not gonna dwell too much on that because uh, my colleagues have done uh, justice as far as this industry is concerned, but I want to, spend more time on the startup ecosystem and then I'll talk about why startups fail okay and uh, taking advantage of the ecosystem how can you as a startup founder uh, take advantage of the ecosystem and what uh, does it have in store for you again the drone industry um, you've heard quite a lot of uh, uh, talks about where the, the the leading sectors that are adopting this technology um, I think with the drone industry, we are probably where smartphones were in the times of BlackBerry. Okay, maybe that is a good, it's not a bad analogy, but uh, we are getting there. It's going to take us some time for us to see mass adoption. Although these numbers are growing rapidly, but they are coming off a very low base. This is the global adoption map, and you can see South Africa is uh, playing its, a big role in the, uh, in the bottom of the, of the continent. I know whenever you talk about drone industry, people will always tell you about what Rwanda is doing, zipline this, zipline that. And I'm saying that is great. But, uh, and I admire what uh, zipline and Rwanda are doing, but uh, in South Africa, there's some amazing use cases that uh, we're doing. I mean, I was talking to Kim, uh, drone in insurance, uh, gift in the mining site in the mining space, and uh, there's quite a lot that is is happening. And, and down in Western Cape, we have aerobotics. So there's quite a lot that we are doing, not only in the in the hardware space, but also within the within the um, uh, the, the the software and uh, payload space as well. But we admire what uh, Rwanda is doing because they're driving. Uh, the, the acceptance of uh, the drone industry. Okay, 
Hope you guys are familiar with the Gartner curve. This is the Gartner curve. Every technology reaches a peak of, of inflated expectations. There was a time when everybody was talking blockchain, blockchain, and probably they are talking less and less of blockchain. And what happens, this technology moves to what we call trough of disillusionment. And then when any majority begin to accept this industry, then it moves to what they call a slope of enlightenment. If you, if you might want to read a book called The Crossing the Chasm by George Moore, who speaks about the, the big chasm between the early adopters and early majority. These early adopters, this is where most uh, uh, people are in the industry. Drone deliveries are still in innovators. They have yet to reach the early majority. Uh, drones in mining, yes, there's early adopters, but uh, 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 we still need to see more uh, just about uh, drones becoming uh, just like any, any, any mining vehicle uh, in the mine, then that's when you're going to see this explosion of the industry. And we believe that uh, we have turned the corner. There was a time when drones were in the trough of disillusionment, but we are in that slope of enlightenment. But we are not there yet, because once we get there, this is where the smartphones are, and this technology is going to explode. Okay. Um, this is the topic I want to talk to you guys about today. Uh, if you guys remember biology, uh, living organisms, um, whereby living organisms, they live in an ecosystem. And uh, what I learned from biology is that a living organism is either it's surviving or it's flourishing. Okay. And uh, the, the reason why it's surviving or flourishing is because of these factors, what we call the abiotic factors, oxygen, air, and everything. If you if if you starve your plants of um, uh, carbon dioxide, they will die. If you starve people of oxygen, they will die, as you have seen with this pandemic. If you starve the animals of water and nutrition, they will die. And then this side, you've got the food chain, and you know who's at the top of this food chain. No, it's not the it's not it, it's not the lion. It's uh, it's us. We are probably the food at the top of that food chain. Some of these animals have to be extinct because they could not survive because of climate change. So if you look, if you take this analogy of an ecosystem and say, for everything to survive, there has to be a balance in the ecosystem, which means all the, there must be just enough factors of these factors. You don't want too much rain because rains will kill the crops. You don't want shortage of uh, um, uh, 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 water or oxygen because all of those factors are going to cause a problem. Now, what is happening in, with climate change is causing an imbalance. This is why we are seeing some of the major shifts uh, in this environment. Um, but now, how do these laws of nature translate into an, a startup ecosystem? And by the way, what is an entrepreneurship ecosystem? Um, the Genius Works define it as a, it is formed by people, startups in a various stages, in various stages, various types of organization in a location, physical or virtual. I'm glad we can now go virtual like we are doing now. Interacting as a system to create a scale and new uh, companies. Okay. If you look at, this is Eisenberg model of uh, the domains of, an, of a startup ecosystem. You've got these six factors, which is finance. Uh, um, finance, sorry, this is supposed to be policy. Policy, finance, culture, support, human capital, and um, and uh, markets policy. This is the sphere of government that creates a, the right environment through policy framework to make sure that small businesses thrive. Okay, this is what well, this is where you see the role of company of entities like CEDA and the Department of Small Businesses. And then you've got the financial markets. Mar financial markets. This is are your lenders, your micro loans, your angels, your investors, the venture capitalists, and private capital, public. And, uh, and, uh, and capital markets. Again, there has to be a, an enough and adequate supply of these factors. And then culture, culture is a success of enterprises in a city, depends a lot on entrepreneurship culture, that, um, that of a metropolis. If you go to Silicon Valley, there's a culture. When someone goes to Stanford, he's not dreaming of getting a great job at IBM or Microsoft or Google. He's dreaming of, of starting a startup that can be bought by those companies, okay, so that he can cash in. And a job is probably a, 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 um, a second prize. 
even if he gets a job, he doesn't want to go straight into Google and those big companies. Yes, it might be cool to work there, but he wants to work in a startup, something that is exciting, that can grow. You know, so that culture in South Africa, unfortunately, it's not there. And uh, I'm not so sure Prof. Lender can weigh in on this, but I can assure you that uh, where I am, most of the people that go to university, if they are in a startup, they are there as a stopgap measure until they find a job. As soon as they find the job, they are out of there. Then there is the issue of support. What is the economic infrastructure that supports um, the startup ecosystem? This relates to broadband infrastructure. We now live in remote working and the, and the startups, they thrive on this. You want in a, to be in a situation whereby you can move from one coffee shop to the next or a co-working space where you can just plug and play with no uh, limits as far as internet is concerned. You need, you need mentorship, you need incubators, accelerators. This is the space where we operate as a, as a Mzans drone accelerator. And then you've got human capital. This is where Prof. Philander's uh, role is, the higher education institutions. Most of the startups were formed at, were inspired or formed at universities. And what is, what is key, for instance, in these startups is that these startups, they create uh, these uh, universities, the higher education institution, they create a platform for people to dream, for, 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 for young people to dream. And you know, some of those guys, some of them didn't even finish school. They dropped out, the like of Bill Gates. And um, some of them, they, 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 they formed their businesses whilst they were at, at varsity, like Facebook was formed at, at a university, you know? And then lastly, it's the markets. Is there an access to the markets? Uh, are you able to access the market or the channels whereby you can market your products? These are, these are the factors that are critical in the startups. Okay, now what sustains the startup? Okay, you've got to look at yourself as a startup, as a living organism in the ecosystem. We have what we call the factors. The factors, these are the abiotic system in the biological sense, but these are, this is capital, human capital, knowledge base, telecoms infrastructure, hardware, software, co-working spaces, culture, uh, support structures, market access or internet access. And then on the other side, you've got the living organisms, which, have, which are which are, are driven by ESD founders in the process of uh, supply development. Here you have to talk to real people, the DFRs, the entrepreneurs, which is you guys, angel investors, uh, VCs, mentors, HEIs, higher education institutions, incubators, accelerators, and tech hubs. So there has to be a balance in the supply of these. What you find in South Africa, for instance, is that um, I'm going to get into why startups fail because they are fa they fail because of a, an imbalance in the ecosystem, and some of this imbalance is caused by either an oversupply of some of these factors or a shortage of supply of some of these factors. We're going to get into that. This is our accelerator uh, system, our contribution to the ecosystem. Uh, we have a 12-week program which we just finished two weeks ago, one in KZN. We're going to be starting another one uh, in Gauteng before the end of the year, and uh, we take. Uh, guys through this, where we say first module, problem solution fit, and then you help you build your minimum viable product, validation, go to market strategy and pitching. And I had gift talking about validation and validation and validation. But why do startups fail? Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm going fast. This presentation is available to every one of you guys uh, should you need it. The biggest reason in terms of the research done by Greylock Partners, Greylock Partners is one of the VC firms based in the States. They say the number one reason startups fail, they build a product for which there is no market. Okay. However, if you look at uh, 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 six out of, uh, six out of uh, uh, 20 of these reasons have got to do with the market. Okay. You either in a bad location, or you just get out competed, or you just don't understand the market. You've got, you understand the problem, you understand the solution, but uh, you thought that problem belongs to that market, but that problem may not belong to that market. You might be talking to the user instead of talking to the customer. Sometimes the customer and the user are not the same thing. You know, if you, find, if you go into a household, um, the, 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 the customer might be me, I use a certain toothpaste, but don't talk to me about that. Probably you need to be talking to my wife who probably is the buyer. So sometimes we talk to the wrong people. 
Okay. Again, the startup journey, we know that there is this, what we call the value of death, uh, where you use your money. Sometimes angels are not even here. You are faced with the triple Fs, the friends, family. Uh, unfortunately, the third F is fools. These are people who will give you money with the hope that you will make it. This is sometimes, this is seed capital. And some of these, uh, up to 80% of the startups, they don't, they don't go out of here, this value of death. And they decide, founders decide, hey man, I've run out of money. I'm going to just go get a job. And sometimes they are so closer to here. Only if they just waited for about three, they persevered for about three to four months or just pivoted and changed something and stopped chasing a, a wrong customer, chase a different customer, then they would get out of this mess and get into become more and more attractive to, 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 to the funding agencies. The funding cycle, again, uh, people will move from bootstrapping family grants, alternative uh, angels, VC, IPOs, and most of them, they don't cross that chasm. Unfortunately, they, 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 they go into grants, some of the founders, they just go into an accelerator program because, hey, there's a grant that we're going to get. There's a challenge that we have to respond to. We just go in there, you know, until we find a job. And uh, real entrepreneurs, they, 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 they start with an end in mind. They want to be talking to these guys. And what these guys are looking for, they are looking for scalable business models, okay? You might be having a great product, but that product, you might be having a very a great um, uh, uh, business model and a great value proposition. However, it may not scale. This is the problem that a drone industry is facing at the moment. Great. Sometimes some of the entities are facing great. Uh, 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 they have great solutions. However, because we, we are not in mass adoption yet, then the scale is not there. If, for instance, all the construction companies, if a drone would be just like a, a, a crane in a construction site, this industry will explode. Okay. But you still find that it's only the early adopters that are excited about the, this industry. Some of the ones who are using it, they, they probably are just trialing it. Some of them, they are using them illegally. Okay, I'm not gonna go into that. Okay, the second reason, like I said, it's the imbalance in the ecosystem that threatens the very existence of startups in the ecosystem. Remember, see, a, a, a startup is also a, a player in the ecosystem. It's one of the living organisms. If you look at the six domains, uh, we are saying these six domains must be in equilibrium. Um, I always hear startups in South Africa, they are saying uh, there's lack of funding. Uh, if I can just say this boldly, that in South Africa, there's no lack of funding. Okay, probably uh, there's more the lack of uh, investable startups with scalable business models. Okay, that, that is in short supply. So when people are saying they, they present their pitch to, 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 to VCs and angels and uh, they get rejected, it's because VCs, they just want businesses that can 10X in, in the next three years. They want businesses that can grow 10 because they are taking a lot of risk. Okay, banks will not even look at you until you have 10X. So you find a situation whereby you're not looking at those people. We've got a lot of venture capitalist companies in South Africa, and some of them are sitting on a pile of cash and they're just looking for business models that can 10X. Unfortunately, if you're trying to 10X in a drone industry, you've got to be able to find your niche, just like what aerobotics have done, which is a great example. They found a niche and they drill on that niche and, um, and uh, that's why investors love, uh, love them. So we are saying, if there is an imbalance, okay, you have too many startups uh, chasing too few, too few funding, but in this instance, it's not a question of many startups facing too few funding. It's too much money just chasing too few startups uh, with business model that can scale, okay. Now, finally, how do you position which is the question that I was, asked, uh, I was asked to try and respond to. I don't have all the answers, but how do you position your startup or your idea? Because uh, they, we've got people here who are still in ideation stage. How do you position it in the ecosystem? I came up with these five uh, uh, suggestions, okay? 
They are not um, the be and end all. Uh, the first one, this one is not original. Uh, in the startup ecosystem, you will hear this over and over again. Fall in love with the problem, not your solution. Okay, why are we saying not your solution? When I talk to young people, all they want to do is that, hey, I just want to create this great app. Okay, great. It's a great app, but what problem are you trying to solve? Are you solving a problem or are you just wanting to uh, get, get yourself busy? Okay, so, and not only must you find that problem uh, and fall in love with it, you must validate it. We, 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 we have a criteria uh, of six, uh, six criteria on how to evaluate a problem. The problem must be growing, the problem must be popular, the problem must be mandatory. Just like for instance, uh, compliance with the drone industry, it's a, it's, it's a problem that needs solution. We've got great people like Sam Twala who found a niche on how to solve that problem and is making money out of solving that problem. It's a mandatory problem. The problem must be urgent. It has to, it has to have a solution now. I mean, if you look at the time it took for the world to develop a vaccine, it was developed on, in a record time and uh, nothing was ever done uh, like it did, all because the problem was urgent. So if you wanna see problems, we are always surrounded by problems that are urgent. You can go and look at those problems and then solve those problems, okay? The next part, sorry, know all the actors in the ecosystem and their roles, okay? We say know who they are, okay? Uh, I'm glad some of, our, some of our startup alumni are attending this, uh, this, this uh, uh, webinar. I'm grateful for that. Know who is in the ecosystem, know what they are doing. And you're only gonna know this if you attend events like this. And it's not only South African events. The nice thing these days, you don't have to travel to attend events. You can attend great events while sitting here. You know, I can attend all events by Drone to Blow, by DJI, was uh, in the comfort of my own home. However, having attended, make sure they also know you, okay? You can, uh, uh, I'm not saying stick out like a sore thumb, but you know, take an interest in what someone is saying. I mean, uh, post a question, post a question, you know, because when you post a question, people will, it will make them think, you know, they'll want to know who has asked that question and do your research so that when you ask a question, when you come to an, a meeting like this, do your research about the companies that are presenting, but do your research about the industry that you're operating in and move from behind, from being just a player in the industry, be an expert in the industry. In fact, move beyond just being an, an, an expert. I mean, I regard people like Sam, like Kim and Gift as thought leaders, you know, because uh, with this, this is where now people will come to you and say, hey, tell us about what is happening, happening in this industry. Because guess what? The money follows the thought leaders. If people are going in that direction, people are gonna follow. I mean, Elon Musk is a kind of guy, uh, he's a maverick, he's a kind of guy, whatever that he does, people will just follow. And the VC and the money will just follow. Make sure you achieve, now this is a big one, it's firstly a problem, secondly, a solution, so thirdly, a unique value proposition, um, and then it's the business model, and then it's the market. Okay, now this is a very interesting chain. Okay, your problem must fit the solution. Okay, once you, once you have the problem fitting the solution, it must also relate to a specific market. You might have identified a great problem, and you might have uh, come up with a great solution, but you may not, you may get it wrong when it comes to the market, or you may get it wrong when it comes to a unique value proposition. Because remember, people don't just buy a solution, they want to buy a product. Now, when you come up with your unique value proposition, it must be unique. Uh, we actually, uh, if you guys want, uh, uh, I can share with you guys a, um, a, a canvas for a UVP, where for instance, it's you, your customer, and your competitors. What makes you unique? Okay, because you got to play where your competition is not playing. And you got to be able to be the one when you talk to your customer, you must be the only one talking to your customer about that problem. But beyond that, you might have a great product, but your business model might be completely wrong. You might be saying, 
my business model, it's, a, it's like a consulting business. I'm going to charge people for giving them advice. Okay. Um, I mean, uh, Gift, for instance, is a, is a drone service provider. He provides services. Okay. But Gift might think uh, one of our startups last year is looking, is, is working on a subscription model. Okay. Where he's got a solution. Okay. If you, if you, for instance, look at companies like Drone Deploy, they operate on a subscription business model. Okay. So your business might be suited to a subscription model, or it may not be suited to a subscription model. So you might have a great value proposition, but your business model is wrong for that particular market. So that's why we are saying this chain must not be broken. Once you achieve the fit in all of these, all of these factors, then you are on your road to achieving what we call product market fit. This is when, for instance, customers will be pulling your product out of, your out of the shelves and all of that. Lastly, uh, second last, find a good ecosystem provider and mentor. Okay, we are one of the ecosystem providers as the accelerator program. But if you are still in ideation stage, you need to go into a, a, an incubator or you need to go into a technology hub. But what is key, make sure that you find a mentor. Someone, I mean, uh, you approach people like Gift. If you believe that Gift is someone who, who can be able to assist you, approach Gift and say, Gift, can you be my mentor? Okay. Most often than not, these mentors, you don't have to pay them. You know, and that is the beauty of it. These people have achieved something and they can guide you. But once you have chosen the mentor, please, this number five, I cannot stress it anymore. It's a, it has become our frustration, my frustration, where, for instance, startups are not teachable. You know, sometimes people are so in love with their, with their, with their solutions that to try and separate them and say, look, it's a great solution, but the market is not there. Okay, it's a great problem, but the solution stinks. So you, you need to be able to be teachable. Okay, once you've chosen a mentor, remember there's a Chinese proverb that says when a student is ready, a teacher will appear, but the, the student must be teachable. You need to be able to, to suck the information and learn from the person that you have chosen. And by the way, I know some of you guys will have three or four mentors and all of them, they are telling you different things and you confuse which one to follow. I would say, just follow someone, one person at a time and one mentor and try and find an ecosystem provider. In some of these big cities, you've got a great ecosystem providers, but the nice thing these days is that uh, the ecosystem providers are sitting now online, they're in the cloud. Uh, I know for instance, uh, one in Cape Town called Startup Circles, which is a, a completely virtual accelerator program that we work with. And uh, you've got others, most of them in the past 18 months, they've gone virtual. We have gone virtual. Ours that we just did, it just com it's completely virtual. The one that we started last year, we were, we were seven weeks uh, uh, um, uh, in person until lockdown came in March of 2020, and we had to all go virtual. And we've since realized that virtual is the way, even post COVID, we're just going to have a hybrid type of uh, accelerator program. Um, Kim, thank you so much for your time. And um, 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 I'd like to take some questions and I leave you with this thought from uh, the co-founder of Hewlett Packard, Dave, Dave Packard, who said, more businesses die from indigestion than starvation. Kim, thank you very much uh, to all of you guys. Thank you so much. And to, to, to the Saldana Bay IDZ, uh, uh, Nogwanda and your team, you guys uh, organize a great event and I'm thankful for the opportunity uh, for you, for, 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 for us to be talking to you and all the people that are in this call and the, accelerate, and the ecosystem builders, the, the, the startups, the founders, uh, wish you guys the best of luck. I'm happy to take some questions. I still have time. Thanks, Kim. Thanks so much, Victor. It's always good to hear from you. Um, and I think the participants here will have gained a lot from your presentation. So thank you so much for that. 
Um, while I wait to hear from Palisha and the team as to any questions that are here, I know some of them have asked for your presentation. Um, I have one quick question for you, Victor, and you, you talk quite a bit about the um, ecosystem, the startup or entrepreneurship ecosystem imbalance. Um, you did mention something about funding and scalable business, but in, in, a, in a South African context, where do you think um, do, or where do you perceive an imbalance in that ecosystem over and above what you've already said? And it, it might, that might be the one that you, you highlight. All right. Kim, Kim thank, thanks very much. And uh, if you look at, for instance, uh, these are the players in the ecosystem, all right? Uh, you might find, for instance, in the, for instance, in the West Coast District, you may probably not have a very good supply of incubators and accelerators okay, in specific sectors. Whereas in the Western Cape, you'll find that they are they are highly concentrated in Cape Town. Okay, even uh, when I say Cape Town, um, Cape Town CBD, and some of them might be in the Stellenbosch area. They, you may find that, for instance, if you go to the areas like Cryfontaine, they're probably not there. If you go to townships like uh, Michel's Plain, Guguletu, you may not find any incubator or accelerator. Okay, so that is the imbalance. Some of the imbalance is caused by, uh, it's historic, okay? It's a legacy of, of, of our past. However, if you take a, a, a place like Johannesburg, Johannesburg is the economic capital of the country. However, Cape Town has a far more established uh, ecosystem than Johannesburg or Gauteng for that matter. Why is that? Why is, for instance, if you take, if you take uh, the city of Tswane, Pretoria, if you go to Pretoria, when it comes to human capital, that city is a, is a student city. There is no shortage of the knowledge base. Those two factors, the highest concentration in the whole of the continent is in Pretoria. You've got the highest concentration of research organizations. You've got the highest concentration of uh, uh, universities, okay, and Johannesburg, which is far bigger than what uh, Cape Town is. However, this is not matched by an equal supply of incubators and accelerators, okay? It's not matched with an equal supply of VCs and angels. So that for me is an imbalance. If you were to find a situation whereby, where you probably find a better balance is in the Western Cape, which is where, for instance, uh, where most of the VCs are. And VCs, by the way, they don't set the terms. VCs, they following the entrepreneurs, they are following uh, uh, they're like fans, you know, when, they, when, when the great entrepreneurs and startups go into a particular area, they follow that money, you know. It's not because the Silicon Valley ecosystem was created by VCs. VCs followed the, the startups, they followed uh, investable startups. So if you want to build a great ecosystem, obviously, this, these actors are, are quite important. We've got some of these uh, in good supply. So you don't want just incubators. In South Africa, again, we've got a, uh, more incubators than accelerators, okay? Incubators are great for entities that are at ideation stage. But when companies have, they have been in business for two years, but they don't have traction, that is when they want to get into an accelerator so that they can get uh, their business to scale assuming that they are in the right market and they are targeting the right uh, product. So in South Africa, I mean, you've got companies, uh, ESD funders, for instance, there's no shortage of ESD funders. I mean, uh, there is, a, there is a, a fund by Old Mutual called Masisiza and the fund. They are complaining. They say, we just don't have investable product. You know, Exaro has got an ESD fund of 250 million. They are battling to find investable uh, entities that they can uh, uh, support and scale up. I mean, uh, 
Yeah, so it, I mean, DFIs, your, your likes of, uh, your likes of uh, IDC, your likes of CEDA and all those entities, uh, they end up funding companies and uh, which don't um, uh, 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 get, they don't get to, uh, to be viable, you know, because at the end of the day, government should be putting money to deal risk, the, to share the risk of the venture capitalists and the angel investors. If government is the only one that is funding and a startup is not attract, attractive to the VCs, then you have a problem. Then you have a huge imbalance, which means the startup must go back to the drawing board and get out there and create and make sure that they're creating the right, they're talking the right language in the right environment. Uh, sorry, I, I, I tried to answer in a very roundabout way, Kim. No, that, that was brilliant, actually, and um, very insightful. Thanks, Victor. Um, you said you had a hard stop at three, so I'm abusing the next 10 minutes. Um, Sam, I think, Sam Twala, did you have your hand up? We have a question on the chat as well, but let's just see if we can get Sam yeah, on. Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, clearly. Go ahead, Sam. Hi, Sam. Right. How are you? <laughs> I'm fantastic. Good to see you again, Kim. And you. As, as usual, you're doing a fantastic job here. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Uh, firstly, I must uh, really commend uh, the organizing team for this fantastic session and all sessions that they've been running uh, since the first one. I think it was, it was sometime, sometime in, in, in August. If there's one thing that also I want to uh, mention is the quality of speakers like today, it's fantastic. And to me, this demonstrates the maturity of a uh, drone industry in South Africa. Uh, if you look at, I mean, uh, if you attend maybe a webinar or maybe even a conference uh, last year, two years ago, and you compare with the quality of presentations that you come across these days, I mean, I must say this industry is really, really growing. Yes, of course, it has its own challenges. So the quick question uh, maybe for, uh, for Victor, who I have a great respect for him in terms of what he does, uh, you know, in his field and his specialty. Uh, what I've noted is in your conversation, you didn't really say much about uh, about compliance, about pilot license, about ROC. Uh, and the reason why I noted that is you hear a lot of startups or people want to get in this industry. The, the first thing that they cry about is uh, we don't have money to get an RPL, we don't have money to get ROC, ROC is expensive. And uh, in your talk, you didn't really mention much about uh, RPL or ROC. So would you say there's a misconception that for you to make it in this industry, you need to have an RPL, you need to have an ROC? You know, how, how you know, misinformed would, that, would someone be thinking that way? If they are, thank you. Can I respond, Kim? Please go ahead, Victor. All right, all right. Um, maybe before I come to Sam, uh, I don't know why Sam wants to ask me a different question, but uh, I, will, <laughs> I will answer it. But before I come to Sam, would Tewo ask a question, which is a great question. What books yes. would you recommend to people who want to start uh, a business? I would, uh, the, 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 the concept that we use in our program is called the Lean Startup Methodology. I would uh, look a book by Eric Ries, uh, The Lean Startup. I would read about Steve Blank, okay? Steve Blank, that is even a, a free course on Udemy. If you go to udemy.com, you can find a book uh, by Steve Blank and a course by Steve Blank. He's also written a book. Uh, you can read book. Yeah, there's, there's quite a number of books. Once you start reading The Lean Startup, you'll find all other books that are there. And your second question, if in your opinion, how could startup contribute to the startup culture? Is it necessary entrepreneurial ecosystem? A culture, the unfortunate, unfortunate thing with a culture is that a culture is something that evolves on its own, okay? If you look at the culture of a Silicon Valley or the culture of the Cape Town ecosystem, it evolves on its own. I know sometimes I always uh, uh, chat with uh, 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 some of my colleagues from uh, uh, Western Cape, even Western Cape government in the city, and um, uh, always saying, uh, they're boasting about how great the ecosystem is. But if I can just share a story, 
the culture of Silicon Valley. Uh, in 2018, I had the pleasure of visiting Silicon Valley where we met with the city of uh, San Francisco. We asked them one question and said, how did you guys get it right? And they, we were talking to the chief innovation officer. And this guy said to us, you know what? This is the question that we get every time. And uh, do you want an honest answer or a, a, a dishonest answer? I said, no, which, whichever. He said, we, we, some of our colleagues will brag about it. But I tell you what, we had nothing to do with it. This is the city of San Francisco. They said, this ecosystem, we had nothing to do with it. It just grew by itself. If you go and ask uh, Stanford University and say, how did you manage to contribute to this ecosystem? They will tell you, we had nothing to do with it. If you ask the VCs there, how, how did you get it right? We had nothing to do with it. I suppose it's something, probably this goes back to um, uh, the academic people like Prof. Philander, is, is that what is it that we instill in our children when they're still at primary school? Are we telling them to, to, to grow up and get a good job or are we telling them to grow up and solve the, uh, some of the world's problems so that they can make the, the money just like Elon Musk and all of those things? And I can assure you, we are taking our kids and we are telling them, hey, you're gonna get a great job. Okay, I've got a 16 year old boy who's thinking about a job, okay? Uh, fortunately, uh, he's starting a, a jewelry business, and uh, and I'm glad that uh, he's doing something around that because uh, uh, I don't want him to be thinking just a job. A job for him must be um, a fallback. Let me come to Sam, my friend. <laughs> um, Sam, we what we say is that until such time that you have what we call problem solution fit that you've identified the problem, you have the solution, forget about ROC, don't even start thinking about an RPR because it may not be something that you want to do. If when we started this company in 2018, if we have decided to say, hey, I've got to go get a, a pilot's license. By the way, I still don't have a pilot's license. Uh, I'm going to get around for it. We, I'm going to get around it in some, uh, some other time. But we've got great people like Gift, uh, who has been training some of our uh, students uh, uh, on the job training. And Kim has been doing a, an excellent job. And sometimes I say, hey, if we are surrounded by people, great people like this, why should I uh, 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 step onto their toes? What I'm saying, Sam, is that uh, once you are clear what your problem is that you want to solve, and once you are clear what product you want to uh, market, you might find yourself that you are great in computer programming. Okay, you might want to go into the software space. You might want to say, look, I want to be a mechanic. I want to go into the hardware space. Then you're probably inspired by people like uh, Prof. Philander. Okay, or you might say, I want to be a drone service provider. Remember, not all companies are going to be drone service provider. Then if you are going to be a drone service provider, you need to talk to Sam. And Sam must tell you, will tell you, okay, how you're going to go about it to get your uh, RPES um, SFSS license, which is from the Department of Transport. You're going to go to the CAA and get the ROC. You've got to make sure that you've got the drone pilots, you've got pilot licenses, and you've got to get drones that, in, that, must, be, that must receive letters of authority. And uh, some people, it's worth it. I mean, King's company has gone through that process, and, uh, but some people, have, have realized that, hey, I don't need to go through that process. I can also, if I need data to be collected, I've got great companies like Gifts Company that can help us do that. Why need, do I need to go in that, in that space? So it's, it depends on what your business model is. If you, are a, you want to be a DSP, drone service provider, by all means, you've got to, get, you've got to be compliant. You don't want to be doing work uh, illegally. You've got to be 100% compliant. Thank you, Sam. Uh, thank you much. Thank you very much, Victor. I mean, uh, I really like that. Thank you very much, and, uh, and Kim as well. And I must say also, uh, I really enjoyed the uh, presentation and learned a lot from from Prof as well, and then Kim um, and then Gift. Uh, very fantastic. And like I said, uh, the quality of presentations. Thank you very much. 
Thanks, Sam. Um, yeah, you know, I think just to um, reiterate your question, Sam, but also to echo what Victor said, um, I often have people who come to me and, you know, ask um, about opportunities and, you know, how they can get going in, in business in the drone industry because they now have an RPL and a drone. And that's their solution. And, the, you know, and they now are ready to go. And the point is, what's the problem that you're trying to solve? Sam, you and I have had these conversations and you actually do presentations on it, right? The drone is not always the answer or you know, your RPL. And so we are often sharing um, you know, that thought, which says your ROC and your RPL um, will get you to the starting line. You know, what you do with that and the problems you're gonna solve are what's going to get you to uh, to win. Um, so yeah, I thought I would just um, echo what Victor's saying. You know, it, it might be something you have to do retrospectively once you know what the problem is you want to solve. Um, so I think we we did very well on time. In fact, it's going to click over to um, the hour right now. Um, thank you so much to our um, wonderful speakers. Thank you so much uh, for the participation, the questions. Um, and, you know, some of these questions were, were really well thought out. Thank you for that. Mateo, um, really good to, to see you on here asking some very valid questions too, and for all the others. We look forward to having you join us, for those of you who are going to, at session number two in 30 minutes. Um, if you don't have the link yet, I think it would have either been sent to you via this Q&A, or you can just go onto the LinkedIn page of um, the Saldana Bay Industrial Development Zone. The registration link will be in there for session two. Um, before you leave, there is a poll that should be popping up, I have been told. Um, and if you could complete that, well, on demand, how good. Um, and that is really about feedback on the session. So please complete that. Thank you so, so much for those of you who dialed in. Hopefully we see some of you um, at 3.30. And um, yes, as you drop off, please just make sure you complete the poll. And um, well done to the organizers, well done to the speakers, and we'll see you at 3.30. Thank you so much.